Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Mary Priniski. I'm a Dominican sister and the executive director of the Aquinas Center of Theology here at Candler. Um, I want to welcome you to our fourth in this year's series called What's Next? Looking at where we need to be going in our church. Um, this particular time, we're going to be talking about the Me Too movement and its impact on the church and what the church needs to do in terms of church too. Um, we are very fortunate to have Natalia with us. We also, for this, I'm doing a commercial now. <laughs> we have copies of Natalia's book called Quentime for sale. They're really not for sale. Actually, we're giving you a really good discount on this book. This book, if you wanted to try to order it on Amazon, costs $35. We're asking for a donation of 20 and Natalia will be there to sign them so you can have a signed copy of her book. Mm -hmm. um, that'll happen after this talk. Um, for those of you who don't know, for the past year and a half or so, maybe almost two now, there's been a group of people meeting at the Aquinas Center talking about what do we need to be doing as lay people in the church to be engaged in church governance. And part of the thing that happened out of that particular um, gathering is that we decided we needed some education. And so uh, the Aquinas Center has been sponsoring uh, twice a semester a talk on different issues in the church, from ecclesiology to church management to canon law, and today it's on women in the church and the Me Too movement. So we're really excited that you're all here. We're very excited that Natalia is here. Um, I get to make the introduction of Natalia, so um, I'm just going to read from what you probably have already heard before, or you've read yourselves. Natalia Imperatory Lee is Associate Professor of Religious Studies at Manhatt Manhattan College in the Bronx where she also coordinates the Catholic Studies program. She is the author of Quentime, Narrative in the Ecclesial Present. Now, if you haven't read Quentime, it is an amazing book. So I'd highly recommend it. So if you haven't had, you have the opportunity to buy one out there. I'm or taking Mary or actually, or actually make a donation <laughs> towards it. Her work focus, focuses on the intersection of Latinx theologies, feminist theologies, and Catholic ecclesiology. Natalia speaks regularly at parishes, universities, and other venues about feminism, faith, and Latinx communities in the United States. Her writing has appeared in Commonwealth and America magazines and has appeared as a guest expert on Pope Francis on CNN and MSNBC. She lives in the Bronx with her spouse and her two sons, Will and Bennett. So we're very excited that she's here with us. Natalia Imperatori. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank Mary especially and Alice Cameron, who makes everything run so perfectly, and Tony Alonzo, everyone here at uh, Candler, at Aquinas. And at Emory, I, I love Atlanta. It's so warm here. <laughs> I have family here. I have really good friends here um, all the way from Miami. So I'm delighted to be with you tonight. Uh, the subject of my remarks tonight is pretty contentious and sensitive. It provokes deep feelings and sincere anger from many different people with many different ideological commitments. I'm going to be talking about assault and abuse, and if these are topics that are difficult for you personally, I want you to feel um, aware and free to step away as you need for your own mental health. I'm also going to be talking about unapologetic feminism, and if that is difficult for you personally, <laughs> I invite you to stick around. <laughs> Feminism is, had for many years become kind of a dirty word, um, a word that was not compatible with Christianity and least of all with Roman Catholicism. Feminism, though, is only the belief that women are human beings in the image of God, and I don't think that too many of us can disagree with that. I approach feminism from an intersectional lens, another word that is apparently now a bad word, 
Um, though all that means is that I am acknowledging in my analysis that racism, sexism, classism, and colonialism are all connected and they intensify each other. They're not things that we can take in a single file line and say, okay, well on Mondays we're gonna deal with sexism, but then Tuesdays and Thursdays we'll do racism. And then once we solve those, we can move on to colonialism. That's just not how the world works, it's not how our minds work, and it certainly is not how our lives have played out. When we talk about marginalization and oppression, we're talking about compounding realities, and we have to acknowledge that. And I hope that comes through in my analysis tonight. As a light-skinned Latina, some would say a white-passing Latina, I reap the benefits of racial injustice, even as I'm marginalized because of my sex and my ethnicity. But honestly, we don't have the luxury of quarreling over words anymore. Not now, not in this church, not in light of everything we know about the rampant abuse and harassment of children, women, and other vulnerable persons in our church and in our country. Just two weeks ago, in a horrifying report commissioned by the L'Arche community, we learned that its founder, Jean Vanier, a hero to so many and someone who was hailed as a living saint for his work with adults who have mental disabilities, abused his power and preyed on women who came to him for spiritual direction. And this is the thing. Sooner or later, this news will come to light about someone that you admired, regardless of your ideological slant. The founder of the Legionnaires of Christ, Marcial Maciel was an absolute monster. He abused young boys and seminarians. He fathered six children by four different women and went on to abuse some of his own children as well. He was a rapist, a morphine addict who also got seminarians and others in his circle addicted to drugs. He was also hailed as an important fundraiser and benefactor of the Roman Catholic Church. And he enjoyed the protection of Pope John Paul II for far too long. Pope Benedict removed Maciel, sentenced him to a life of penance and silence, and put the legionnaires under new direction. But the abusive culture persists in this group with allegations of abuse and cover-ups, priests sent to ask abuse victims to lie and settle for a cash payout. payout. Things like this are still in the, in the culture of the legionnaires. And we know that these are only the most visible stories. The singular stories that make headlines like these shouldn't obscure for us the banality and the ubiquity, the everydayness of sexual abuse in our church. The Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report named more than 300 priest abusers and several bishop enablers only a couple of years ago. The lists coming from dioceses, religious orders, and now even lay organizations like L'Arche make this abuse crisis seemingly endless. So why continue to bring them up? Because the very first step in learning from movements like Me Too and Church Too is to look at abusive cultures straight on. If we look away because we are squeamish or because we don't want that kind of negativity or we choose to focus on the positive, we are effectively turning our backs on the suffering of vulnerable people around us. And let's not make a mistake. In cultures that use authority and secrecy as currency, all of us are potentially vulnerable people. So let's quickly set out, this is a class, right? Let's set out some terms. Let's do some definitions. Um, I'm going to be talking about sexual abuse, sexual assault, and sexual harassment. They're not all the same thing, but they all flourish in similar cultures. In fact, some cultures are particularly receptive hosts to sexual misconduct that can go anywhere from hostile work environments to child rape. Sexual assault is sexual contact that occurs without the explicit consent of a victim. 80% of these are committed by someone known to the victim. Sometimes sexual assault is couched in euphemisms like non-consensual sex, which is a lot of letters to say the word rape. The word in English for non-consensual sex is rape. There's no such thing as non-consensual sex. Sexual abuse of children refers to any kind of sexual contact with a child because children cannot consent to sexual activity of any kind. Harassment, sexual harassment, encompasses a variety of behaviors that can range from unwanted sexual advances and the creation of a hostile work environment, all the way through lewd or targeting comments to rape and assault in the workplace. Like I said, they're not all the same crime, they don't carry the same punishments. One thing they do have in common is the likelihood that perpetrators we'll get away with it. It is notoriously difficult to get a victim to come forward, in large part because our justice system and our church are not hospitable to survivors of sexual violence. 
We live, and I, I mean, I hesitated to say this, but it's true, so whatever. We live in a culture of rape. I used to think that was a hyperbolic, kind of sensationalized way of talking that the undergrads like to use because they love outrage. But as it turns out, right, it's really an apt descriptor of the world that we're living in. Rape culture is the assumption, and I think we were all raised to it to some extent, certainly the Cuban girls in the room were raised with this, <laughs> that given the opportunity, men will assault women sexually that the only thing standing between you and sexual assault is the precaution that you take as the potential victim. But basically, men have uncontrollable drives and women have to take steps to prevent harm to themselves. That's rape culture. That we assume that this is how men are or this is just the way that the world is, that it tends toward rape, so we need to put guardrails in place, right? like carrying mace or learning self-defense or not jogging at night or not jogging with headphones, or watching your drink in a bar, or not going somewhere by yourself. Because to make yourself vulnerable is to invite the inevitable. That inevitability is the normalization of assault. That is a culture of rape. I was watching, little digression, Back to the Future with my boys. What a rapey movie that is. So there's this scene where um, Marty's mom is at, at a dance and she's in the car with Michael J. Fox and he uh, confronts the bully, Biff, and once the bully sees that she's in the car by herself, the assumption is that he is going to rape her. And nobody really does anything about it. It just sort of, she's screaming no. It's not like she's not saying no. Screaming no, please don't do this. It was a very kind of eye-opening thing to think that this was a movie that was PG. This is how we trained children to think about teenagehood. That if you were the kind of girl who were in a car with a boy, whatever happened to you was your own fault, right? Because what could you do? What did you expect him to do? That's rape culture, right? I don't know that my kids were appropriately scandalized by it, I think because they just wanted to cringe about kissing at all. But I was horrified. So. Activist Tarana Burke coined the phrase Me Too in 2006 to bring attention to the pervasiveness of sexual harassment that women face in the workplace and the world at large. The phrase became part of our national lexicon in 2017 when it began trending on Twitter accompanying women's stories of harassment. It grew like a tsunami of horror. Harvey Weinstein, Matt Lauer, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Juno Diaz, Tavis Smiley, Charlie Rose, Charlie Rose. <laughs> Isn't PBS supposed to be this kind of bastion of boring culture? Growing up, I thought that the, it was like the height of being an American was to get your news from PBS, right? <laughs> we were watching Univision and all kinds of crazy things. But the people who were watching PBS were obviously the real Americans. Little did we know that PBS was just full of gross predators too. Right? Charlie Rose would hang out in a, a robe in his office with nothing on underneath. Like all the Catholic cases I referenced above, those are just the headline grabbers. The real headline is all the women who raise their hands in recognition. Oh yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, that's happened to me. Oh yeah, I've had employers make sexual comments or touch me inappropriately. I have strangers holler at me on the street no matter what I'm wearing. Oh yeah, someone in a position of power over me has made comments about my body or about my intimate life. I remember being struck by the amount of men who disrobe in their offices during the workday. Like, I had no idea that this was a pervasive problem or that we needed to put into law that men should keep their pants on outside of their homes. But it was apparently a thing, Charlie Rose, Matt Lauer, right? All of these men were routinely walking around unclothed in their offices. This has never occurred to me. How can they not know that that is appalling behavior? How far have we insulated them from consequences <laughs> that you can drop your pants in your office on the regular and nothing happens? This is sort of shocking to me. So we have this whole Twitter movement of Me Too. And the thing is, is that women have been here before. 
right? In the consciousness raising groups of the 60s and 70s, women saw their own experience of invisibility, of harassment, in the stories told by their friends and neighbors. Early feminists of the period referred to the sense of recognizing your own experience in the story of someone else as a feminist clique. Jewish theologian Judith Plaskow refers to the yeah, yeah moment. <laughs> Um, uh, meetings of women graduate students at Yale, right? That feeling of hearing someone complain about something you thought was just something that was part of your life and going, yeah, yeah, right? Maybe of hearing your idea repeated in a seminar by a man and then it being picked up as a really great idea <laughs> or being talked over constantly or, you know, being harassed or being called sugar or being ex expected to refill the coffee or passed over for a promotion because you were just going to have a baby anyway, right? You thought that was just a part of life. Right? Doing the double shift, coming home and all that work being invisible because you really weren't present at the office since you had a sick kid at home. Yeah, yeah, that happens to me. Yeah, I also feel that way. So in those gatherings, something clicks for women, or they are prompted to say, yeah, it isn't just me. I didn't bring this on myself, right? I'm not, because I'm not assertive enough, or I give off a vibe, so that must be why he's hitting on me. The boss is doing the same things to my coworkers. Well, once I realize that, I don't have a problem, right? I have solidarity with those who also have this problem. And we, together, have a movement. And that's what I think um, Tarana Burke gave us in Me Too. But the consciousness raising that gave rise to second wave feminism was limited in its scope. Right? It helped white, middle, and upper class women secure important rights, like the holding of money in bank accounts in their names, the normalization of working outside the home, some recognition of the labor involved in caring for families and households, but that movement left many women behind. Writer and activist Sarah Ahmed refers to a different kind of feminist sound, not a click, not a yeah. She calls it a snap. Like a branch on a tree, she says, women who are derided, harassed, raped, silenced, disbelieved, eventually get to a point where they snap. Right? The snap is loud. And women who snap raise a stink. They demand to be noticed, and they demand justice. But more often than not, particularly in the case of women of color who suffer marginalization on the basis not only of their sex, but of their race and their economic class, those women are viewed as problematic, right? as prima donnas, as demanding troublemakers who are difficult to work with. Why? Because we hear the snap, but we never consider the pressure, the indignity, the harassment that bent that branch until it could no longer bear the weight. We should think very seriously about how often our cultures focus on the snap as violent. Oh my God, the branch fell. It could have hit somebody on the way down. But we never think about all of the violence that led to the snap, that first violence, right? Gustavo Gutierrez, a liberation theologian from Peru, refers to poverty as a first violence, right? That people are operating out of an already violent context. And then when they react, we assume it's this horrific eruption of violence, when in fact, it's a reaction to a first violence. So some women click, and some women, yeah, yeah, and some snap, and now many of us have said, me too. The common ground to all of those sounds is the emergence after that initial light bulb moment of solidarity of the unifying power of experience that prompts us to work for justice. And if you think about it, that is not a terrible definition of the church a unifying power of experience that prompts us to work for justice. The same year Me Too was trending, a Nashville-based poet, Emily Joy, added her own hashtag to the mix. She added church too. Joy wanted to draw attention to how Protestant pastors, and evangelical ones in her case, had groomed young people for assault through youth programs and mentoring and other seemingly innocuous um, ministries. Her hashtag and the wave of reaction to it revealed how predators select and prepare victims through seemingly holy channels, often housed in churches. Even theologian, Catholic theologian Emily Reimer Berry has surmised that the way we catechize children in Roman Catholicism with an emphasis on obedience to authority and the secrecy of the confessional 
along with the attendant shame about sin, might lay the groundwork for abuse. Everything is um, really broken. <laughs> And the problem seems so deep-seated in our institutions and in our culture that we can feel hopeless. Further, it seems that the tendency towards sexual assault is not confined to the Catholic Church or the business world, both of which tend to be organized hierarchically. What Church 2 showed us is that abuse flourishes in all kinds of church communities, the ones that are organized presbyterally, the ones that are organized by councils, the ones that are organized charismatically. So it's not just a hierarchy problem. Abuse and harassment flourish in Hebrew schools and in the Boy Scouts, at PBS and at NBC, at Fox and at MSNBC, in urban and rural areas. Predators exist. They seek access to children and other targets. It is one of the most terrifying things about parenthood. Predators don't look creepy. That's why they succeed. If every predator looked like a creep, none of them would ever have a victim. So let's turn our attention now to three other factors that I think contribute to abuse tolerant and abuse enabling cultures and what we can do in terms of next steps. A lot of my students and my family wish that we would just move on from the constant talk of sexual abuse and sexual harassment. And moving on is, sometimes means walking away or changing the channel and that is super tempting. But in order to move on as followers of Christ, we cannot look away from suffering or change the channel to something else. Moving on for the church involves at least three confrontations to my mind, with misogyny, with secrecy, and with shame. In other words, I think we have to have serious conversations about sexism, sexuality, and clericalism in the church and beyond it. Only by its Lent, right? Only if we move through this desert. <laughs> can we emerge on the other side transformed? So first, let's confront some misogyny. <laughs> it's exciting. We can do this. That's not a word I heard a lot growing up. Um, and not just because I grew up in a really patriarchal culture, but it's just not a word you heard a lot a long time ago. It sounds really extreme and implausible, right? We think of it as hatred of women. And I mean, really, who hates all women? Everyone can find one woman they like, right? You all had a mom. So nobody can really be a misogynist then, right? Because everybody loves their mom. Turns out not how it works. I fear sometimes now, now we've swung the pendulum to the other end and we end up using misogyny when we mean discrimination or we, misogyny when we mean regular sexism. Um, here I found the work of philosopher Kate Mann to be really helpful. She's written a magisterial work on misogyny called Down Girl, and you should all read it, but like prepare to be really depressed because <laughs> it's really bad. <laughs> Um, in it, she reorients our, our understanding of misogyny away from feelings, right? This is a, something I do, I do a lot with my students. I, we're not talking about religion like this, your Oprah religion about your feelings. We're talking about religion here, right? You're thinking religion with your brain, right? So what she wants to do is reorient misogyny away from feelings and toward actions, right? It isn't about whether you can self-report that you hate women, because that depends on number one, something that is impossible to quantify. How many women do you have to hate before you're a misogynist? Right? Do you have to hate them a lot? Or if you find them annoying, are you a misogynist? Right? Do you have to plot their murder? Or is just kind of like maybe thinking about it once in a while, does that make you a misogynist? Right? That's impossible. Secondly, that definition of misogyny as a feeling is located in the person doing the hating. And so it centers the perpetrator, the misogynist, and his feelings and his self-awareness of his feelings, and his self-reporting of that self-aware feeling. No, let's not do any of that. For man, and this is a quote, misogyny should be understood as the law enforcement branch of a patriarchal order, which has the overall function of policing and governing, and enforcing, rather, its governing ideology. End quote. It is, in other words, not something psychological in a person who may or may not hate women, but rather it's an action, right? A thing done, a punishment felt. Not all women feel the punishment. This is crucial because the police only interfere with you if you get out of line, right? So a lot of women thrive in misogynistic cultures because they toe the line, the good women. 
what is the line that we're held to in patriarchy? Well, for man, right, M-A-N-N-E, Kate Man. I'm just going to say Kate Man every time so you don't think I'm talking about men in the abstract. For Kate Man, women are expected to be, and this is a devastating quote, men's attentive, loving subordinates. Does that sound familiar to you? What do you think of when you think of a good woman? Or here's a better question. Who are Catholics supposed to think of when they think of a good woman? Yes, the Virgin Mary, gold star for the gentleman in the plaid. <laughs> Mary, right? Or the saints, right? Few saints are women. Even fewer saints are women who were ever married. And the fewest saints of all are women who were married but lived in regular marriages where people have sex their entire lives. None of those people are saints. The married women who are saints had children. Many of them had all their children go into religious life and then lived as brother and sister with their spouse until they died. Right, which is a euphemism for they never had sex again. These are the women that we elevate to the canon of Christian saints. Women who aren't good are therefore bad. Bad for a woman, badness, can mean a lot of things. But overall, these offenses are classed as violations of the good standard, right? Not virginal enough, not deferential enough, not attentive enough, not nurturing enough. Good womanhood, in Catholicism, has been presented to women as almost entirely wrapped up in suffering. The Mater Dolorosa of the Pieta, the mother who frets for her son's sanity at the beginning of his ministry, the mother who frets about her child lost in the temple. The mother who gives birth silently in a cave or a barn. You take your pick. Of the infancy narratives. Right? It's always Mary somehow anxiety-ridden and suffering and quiet. This is the good woman. Of course, the relationship between Mary and Jesus is unequal, and it has to be, right? He's God. She is not God. That this relationship, Jesus Mary, becomes the template for all male female relationships is the problematic through line in Catholic theology with which we have to contend. And it's a big one, folks. The history of subjugating women in Christianity isn't an accident, and it's not really all that temporary, and it's not something we can easily brush away. So everything that you learn in feminist theology that first day where they're like, guys, it's really not that bad, it's okay, we're gonna fix this. Yeah, I have to tell you, no, it's a lot more pervasive than we think that it is, and it's not something that we can sort of excise from the Christian tradition. It is something that instead we have to wrestle with. While some scholars have made compelling cases for why Jesus was atypical in his treatment of women, right, accepting them as disciples equally, not condemning women in adultery, which are really rape situations, the same cannot be said of Jesus' followers. The sexism in our theology and in our church history runs very deep, but I'm going to give you some greatest hits just in case you've forgotten and also because they're fun to talk about. Tertullian, the best, taught that each woman, I'm looking at you ladies, was another Eve the devil's gateway, through whom sin entered the world and because of whom the Son of Man had to die. Each of you. <laughs> Augustine, in the next century, or two centuries later, I guess, taught that men were in the image of God, but women were not. Not fully, anyway. Because women were aligned with the body and men with the spirit. So women were only in the image of God when taken together with a man. Sounds bad, ends up coming back much worse. Aquinas, Aquinas, where are we? Sorry. <laughs> Aquinas taught that women were defective males. If something had gone wrong during copulation, if the wind had blown from the wrong direction, you would get a female child. This is only one trifecta of many, many ways in which the Christian tradition communicates women's inferiority and justifies our subjugation continually. Most recently, we see this in the complementarian theology that comes from the Vatican since the pontificate of John Paul II. Complementarity, one of our 
favorite new words, is the belief that men and women are two halves of a whole. Right? Think Augustine. And that the gifts of each complement the other. That sounds very beautiful and very romantic. And we even say it in the secular world, right? Opposites attract, right? And he makes up for what I lack. And cute things like that, right? It was just Valentine's Day. Um, there are lots of cards like that on Valentine's Day. It sounds like a lovely part of God's design, right? Because it is, after all, based in the genital or the biological complementarity of men and women. And I don't want to deny that biological complementarity right now. But let's ask ourselves if biological complementarity necessarily implies psychological complementarity, right? Does it? What about social complementarity? What about academic complementarity? Remember math is hard, Barbie? I do. What about employment complementarity? One crucial flaw in complementarian thinking is that it takes a biological assumption about sexual intercourse, namely that it is always ever only done one way, and turns that into an entire social order where men are initiatory and aggressive and women are receptive and nurturing. So we get women's special nature and their vocation to motherhood, spiritual motherhood or physical motherhood, but whatever it is, you're a mom. We have no similar documentation of men's nature or men's vocation, either because it is assumed or left wide open with possibility. Hmm. Receptive and nurturing. Where have we heard that before? Women are to be men's attentive, loving subordinates. <laughs> Keep in mind that misogyny assigns women crucial roles. We are, after all, necessary for the propagation of the species, right? There are moms in the audience. We're very special. It's very important. But being made to feel special is not the same as being given the freedom of self-determination. A pedestal is a prison. It seems like a good idea at the time, but as it turns out, you're trapped on a tiny marble arch. And you can't move from there without falling apart. That's misogyny. Right? It's what keeps you in that little three-foot square and if you make a move the wrong way, misogyny will be there to knock you right back in. Sometimes when I read the pains that papal documents or Vatican documents go to to emphasize the special, necessary nature of women's voices or the need to protect women from clericalization or from the messiness of work outside of home or from the messiness of politics, quite frankly, I want to scream. <laughs> That is a template for misogyny, a how-to of becoming an attentive, loving servant. And honestly, have any of you ever lived through norovirus with children? Whoever protected a mom from messiness? Right? Have you had everyone in your family barfing at the same time? Yeah. Who was coming to protect you? Literally nobody. Right? Women, especially non-white women, have never in their lives had the luxury of being protected from messiness. Quite frankly, they were frequently cleaning up everybody else's mess. Least of all mothers require protection from messiness. Those of us who have given birth certainly know this. Those of us who have nurtured children who are little disgusting creatures know this, right? Messiness is what life is. We are mired in it. And that is something that complementarian thinking just doesn't allow. In this vision of perfect complementarity between husband and wife, between Christ and the church, the perfection glosses over reality. Right? What is some of that reality? That two-parent households where the mom stays home to care for the kids has always been the province of the white middle class. And it has always been used as a cudgel to talk about the irresponsibility of non-white parents for example. Complementarian theology is problematic because it relies on and perpetuates stereotypes because it is essentially a template for misogynistic thinking by setting the parameters against which women will be judged. But maybe most damningly because it's not real. Real mothers cannot be nurturing all of the time without depleting themselves. 
real life is messy and ambiguous, and there are bills and layoffs, and sometimes women get very angry and aggressive, and that is okay and warranted. Sometimes they are not subservient or pleasant, and sometimes they even initiate sex. Imagine that. Let's confront shame. That was misogyny. <laughs> Just as we have to confront how deep those roots of misogyny go in our Christian tradition and all the ways in which the church has furthered the agenda of the patriarchy and the domination of women, these are sins of commission, right? Things that we have done. We must also look long and hard at a great sin of omission. We have reneged on our responsibility to teach young people about sexuality in productive or healthy ways. I have many stories here because I teach a sexuality class in New York. And maybe it's because they're Irish, but most of my students were never told anything about sex by their parents at all. At all. What they got from their church was an almost exclusively sin-laden landscape and therefore one that is overlaid with shame. Even in a regular gen ed religion class, so Manhattan College is culturally mostly Catholic. Excuse me, some of them are, uh, most of them don't practice anymore, and the ones who do, you know, they went to Catholic school, they kind of know. They have the mental furniture of Catholicism. So you ask them, okay, can you give me an example of a sin? Premarital sex, abortion, and homosexuality. Every time. Sometimes I think that the contemporary gospel, at least the one believed by most Catholics, is that trinity, right? No premarital sex, no abortion, no homosexuality. That's like what Jesus said, right? It's what they learned, right? It's those three prohibitions that we have sent them into college with. Roman Catholic teaching on sexuality, boy, it's a trip if you've been through it. It remains rooted in Aristotelian notions of biology. Right, where the male is the generative principle and the female is the receptive one. So Aristotle thought that every sperm contained a little person, a homunculus, and that person was planted in the mom. Right? And she had fertile ground. We still talk about fertility and infertility. You see, it's all so pervasive, right? And like sometimes people talk about a special hug and then the dad plants the seed in the mom. This is all Aristotelian, right? This is all Aristotle that we have to thank for this. Totally not at all how it works biologically, but we're just running with it, right? <laughs> And so, of course, a church that is teaching that about sexuality, it follows that a complementarian theology makes sense, right? Where the men are the active principle and the women are the receptive, right? The fertile ground upon which you plant the seed, it makes sense, it's just wrong, that you plant the seed and it grows into a full human being. Our church teaches that the only licit sexual expression occurs in the marriage bed of a heterosexual couple that does not use contraception of any kind. Outside of marriage, virginity and celibacy is expected and taught. In this country, especially in the southern part of this country, purity culture has filtered in, with an idealized notion of sexuality helped along by the popularity of the theology of the body in the Roman Catholic Church. What we learn in high school about sexuality, and there's someone here from my high school so she can back me up, <laughs> is when in doubt, don't. Don't is the overarching theme, don't be gay. Don't have sex before marriage. Don't masturbate. Don't have impure thoughts. Don't use contraceptions. Don't get pregnant. Don't have an abortion. Don't lose your virginity. Furthermore, where our notions, and this is sort of a more theoretical point, but our notions of social morality, right, Catholic social teaching, has since the 19th century, since Rerum Novarum, been framed with principles for reflection, criteria for judgment, and guidelines for action. Our sexual morality, though, is still acts-based. That is, rather than principles that then become criteria, that then become guidelines, that assume a moral agent capable of discernment in the complexity of history, sexual teaching is still propositions from the past about procreation held up as absolute moral laws to be obeyed or disobeyed. No moral agency or discernment needed, no shades of gray, if you will pardon the best-selling pun. With our money, we're able to discern the right course of action for ourselves, our family, and our world. With our genitals, we must be told what to do because our consciences stop working. And what has that brought us? Humane Vitae came out in 1968, and more than 90% of Catholic women of childbearing age used birth control. 
Did it bring more holiness? Or did it just drive people underground with their sex lives? The naming of homosexuality as intrinsically disordered happened in 1975 in Persona Humani. Did that make fewer gay people? No. It drove them to hide their identities and then to leave the church. In some cases, taking their families with them, and in others, alienating them from the people they loved. Today, other than in pre-Cana, we have very little forthright discussion of sexuality in Catholic circles, or we did until the abuse crisis happened. And that's the thing. Abuse flourishes in cultures of secrecy and shame. And our sexual teachings <coughs> excuse me, are almost entirely shame-based. We hold up Mary, a literal impossible ideal as a perpetual virgin who is also a mother, for girls to imitate. The failure is built in. Purity culture, as we instantiated in Catholicism, with our emphasis on abstinence and the sacredness, which is actually good, right? The sacredness of a sexuality, but that goes unexplored in any way before marriage, but should always be open to pregnancy. This is a toxic combination, because purity is a toxic notion. The Lutheran theologian and pastor, um, Nadia Bowles Weber, notes that we have confused purity with holiness. But purity is about preservation, right? About separation from pollution, right? To remain pure, you have to remain separate. But holiness is about union, right? Union with God, namely. Other thinkers like Ruth Everhart, whose book I recommend to you um, very highly, she studied the Me Too movement and the church's response to it. She notes that purity and virginity cultures are dangerous to women in a lot of ways. First of all, the most prized thing a woman has, her virginity, is something that can be taken away from her by force and without her consent. Consent itself, secondly, which is a necessary part of sexual activity, is completely overlooked in cultures of purity and abstinence. Before marriage, consent is not allowed. And after marriage, consent is assumed. So there's never a discernment or a negotiation. Everhart notes that the more conservative church cultures provide a seedbed for abuse, right? Homosexuality is taboo. Abstinence is the answer to all teen questions about sex. Modesty becomes paramount, and violations are virulently shamed. This drives all sexual activity into a realm of secrecy and shame. And that rolls out a red carpet for abusers. I recently um, reconnected with a friend from Miami. He actually went to high school with my brother, who's the valedictorian of the Belen class of 1987. And um, he's now a psychologist in DC who works with the archdiocese. He does screening for seminarians and also works with abuse, abuse victims, um, with predator priests, and just average run-of-the-mill priests. One thing he notices, we're talking one day about you know, clericalism and the priests and all this stuff, and he says he sees a lot of guys who have these non-integrated sexual identities and how difficult it is to treat, mostly because some men come to see him and they are incapable of even naming sexual things without resulting to euphemisms, right? Adult, grown men. They cannot bring themselves to use anatomically appropriate words for body parts. Again, full-grown men or to speak about arousal in anything but very veiled, very sort of roundabout ways. How can we expect integrated people to emerge from climates where we cannot talk about sexuality, desire, and sexual expression without resorting to like a childhood euphemism? How do we foster a culture of concern around the intimacy of sexuality if we can't even say the words, if even uttering the words are shameful? Even more devastatingly, how do we expect victims to come forward when we've shrou shrouded all activity that happens with your private parts as something that's private and shameful? Right? Abuse is something that happens that is, involves your private parts that is not shameful, that has to be made public. But we don't give people the words or the welcome. The pedestal applies here, too. When we elevate sexual expression, like the theology of the body does, to a quasi-liturgical thing, when we glorify marital sexuality as if it were a mystical experience in every instance, don't laugh, married people, we are trafficking in shame. 
Because real life doesn't work that way. We teach all these young adults that sex is to be avoided, 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 and then on their wedding night, they're supposed to what? Flip a switch and think it's the most amazing thing in the world? It goes from being super terrifying and like dangerous to being the only thing, you know, the, the most sacred thing that they can do in their marriage, what, in one night? That doesn't make any sense. How are they going to flip that switch? How are they going to make that mental adjustment? Talking about sex only through a lens of fear and shame is toxic, but reducing sex, right, as the secular culture wants us to do, to a contract where only one party, usually the woman, can give or withdraw consent like a candy machine, that's not the answer either, right? We talk about models of consent, but that also puts the burden on one partner to say yes or no, right, the dispenser model. Right? You're always, and then if something happens, it's, the fault, it's a faulty dispenser. Right? It's never the fault of someone else. So we need to foster a, kind of, a different culture here. What we need is a sexual ethic of concern, I think. Concern for self and other, concern for community, concern for integrity. But instead of accompanying young people who are marrying later and later, right, through a biological sexual exploration that is perfectly developmentally appropriate, we leave them in the wilderness of shame and silence. This contributes to the abuse crisis and forthright conversations about sexuality way before pre cana are an important start. pre no. <laughs> Just no. Right? If you've already decided that you're going to marry somebody, that's not the first day that you should start talking about sexual expression. It's just not. If you call with an engagement to the parish rectory, you should have already had many conversations about fostering a culture of concern around your sexual needs and interests. Right? If that is the start of that journey for you, we're way late to the party. So now let's confront secrecy and clericalism. That was the sex part. Creating programs that start conversations about sexuality is an important investment in the future of our church and of our world. But that's not only or even the immediate response that the sexual misconduct crisis needs. Everhart gives us three indicators of a potentially abusive church culture. She says, any tight-knit faith community can become a breeding ground for abuse and secrecy, especially if, here are her characteristics, if it revolves around a charismatic leader, if it is reluctant to address issues of sexuality forthrightly, and it is self-policed by an elite group. Right, we talked about two. So let's talk about one and three and have a serious conversation about clericalism. Clericalism is the cause du jour of the sex abuse crisis, right? We went through a period where it was homosexuality and then that got tossed. And then we went through a period where it was celibacy and now that's been tossed. And now we're back to, you know, it's, it's clericalism. That's definitely the problem. The belief that the clergy are exempt from human failing and are somehow superhuman has deep roots in the Christian tradition. Namely, in the notion of higher and lower states of life. Maybe you've heard this, right? That there are some states of life that are just holier than other states of life. Prior to Vatican II, and still in the minds of many Catholics, there were some people who were just, well, holier than other people, right? Sorry, we don't make the rules. This is just how it is. The priesthood was the highest state of life because a priest could transcend physicality, right? It's wrapped up in this Greek philosophical idea where the spirit is higher than the body, than matter, and to be able to deny the body and be more, more like closer to being pure spirit meant you were closer to God. So the priest, because they denied one specific part of their physicality, namely sexuality, I don't know that many priests who don't eat. So it was this one particular part of their physicality that they were um, denying meant that they were the highest state of life. Right underneath them, because they were women, sorry, were the nuns who were also denying a state of life, right? Perpetual virginity, this was also good, right? You're up there, nice, right? And then the lay people, right? What are we going to do with this, right? <laughs> this was when marriage, the definition of marriage, was a haven for lust, when marriage was like the garage where you parked your lust, <laughs> where if you had so much sexual desire that you couldn't keep it under control, then I guess it's okay to get married. Just know that you're not as holy as the people who did not. Right? This sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? And yet, and yet, 
we expect our priests to be superhuman all the time. Right? One of the things that Roly and I were talking about, he's a psychologist, and so he can never lose it on his kids in front of people who know what he does. <laughs> right? He's like, I, I always needed a group of friends where I could yell at my children right? and just totally lose it because if I'm, he's like, one time I was wrangling a kid outside of mass and like, everyone had melted down and it was a disaster. He's got three kids. He's shoving somebody into the car seat and they're doing this, you know? <laughs> And he's like, oh, just losing it. And somebody walks by and is like, huh, even the psychologist has trouble with the kids. And he's like, you know, come on. And we do this to priests too, right? Where can a priest go where he can really be himself? It's so isolated, right? And if you see a priest doing something bad, you're like, did he say the F word? Oh, my God, a priest said a bad word. I saw him with a drink in his hand. Right? We exempt them from humanity. This is a very big problem. Right? Those of us who couldn't hack celibacy could be somewhat holy, but whatever. How do I know that the Greek influence is still lingering in the Catholic Church? What, what happens when you die? What goes to heaven? Your soul, Mary. Your soul, <laughs> not your body. Bodies are gross, but souls are clean. <laughs> Thank you, Greek philosophy. <laughs> I think the abuse and cover-up crisis did a lot to put an end to the states of life fallacy, or I hope it did, right? Reminding us that priests are also humans capable of great sin and great crime. But it lingers, man, it lingers. In part, this is due to our historical and theological myopia, right? We mistake the way things are for the way they've always been. Or we read into scripture more than is there, particularly when it comes to Jesus establishing the priesthood as it is today. The causes of clericalism are historical, scriptural, and even psychological. But the effects of our clerical culture have been devastating, not just for lay people in the church, but for the clergy themselves. The first effect that I was talking about is the insularity of clerical culture. As an all-male institution with male hierarchs and decision-making roles, clergy are and remain accountable to clergy. While parish councils exist and lay review boards exist, these are largely in an advisory capacity, which means clerics are free to listen or to ignore recommendations. They are, there are exceedingly few examples of situations where lay people have the power, for example, to fire a priest. The insularity and monoculture of the priesthood breeds a kind of entitlement to which the laity definitely contribute. What do I mean by entitlement? Right. Uh, Kate Mann talks about male entitlement as sitting in a restaurant. Right. When you're sitting in a restaurant, you expect the waitress to come over. Right. And if you see the waitress over on her phone and ignoring you, you start to get a little agitated. And you're like, I'm sitting here. You know, Let's go. And then you start to get angrier and angrier because you think she's ignoring you or somebody got their food before you or whatever. This is entitlement. In a restaurant, it's a situation where it makes sense. In a sexual exchange where a woman is walking down the street and not paying a man attention and he's angry that he's not, she's not paying him attention, that's entitlement. Right? So what do I mean by clerical entitlement? How many priests do you know who do their own laundry and cooking and cleaning? Actually, that's not Has it? That's really good. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. Go, go Atlanta. I think that's wonderful. Um, how many of us expect this from priests? How many of us expect this from our husbands? <laughs> Me too. Um, why not? Are they not human beings? Are we not human beings? Who is not a person in the equation? Entitlement can operate in a lot of ways, and we don't always experience it as the danger that it is. After all, even Vatican II encouraged the lady to support the mission of the church, and isn't helping father with meals or a cleaning lady or the like supporting the mission so that he can focus on other things? Yeah. But entitlement is dangerous, right? Entitlement coupled with insularity is particularly dangerous, right? I always joke about the, the Jesuits all in their houses have a magic closet where you put in your dry cleaning dirty and you come back in a week and you pull out your dry cleaning and it's done because someone took it and someone picked it up and it's a magic closet. 
where all you have to do is put your stuff there. Amazing! I want one of those for my house. <laughs> I'm not going to get one. If we learn nothing else from the abuse crisis, if we continue to learn nothing else, it's that an insular, entitled class of persons is incapable of self-policing. Our tendency towards self-protection and the economy of secrets, particularly sexual secrets, create a climate where the truth is sacrificed again and again and again. Consider, if all sins are horrifically shameful, right, all sexual sins especially horrifically shameful, and you know you've got yours, how likely are you to expose those of the people you work with who may know your secret too? Or in a less insidious example, let's consider the notion of scandal. God, that word. Our biggest problem in Roman Catholicism over the last 40 years has been a profound misunderstanding of what scandalizes the faithful. As Everhart puts it, and it's just poetic, evil resides in the actions and inactions of people who fear the wrong thing, who fear exposing evil when they should fear complicity with evil, who fear damage to reputation when they should fear damage to the vulnerable, who fear the demands of pursuing justice when they should fear the consequences of not doing so. That is the end of that quote. Where some thought that if lay people found out about pedophile priests, that would be a scandal, it turned out that the actual scandal was the massive cover-up that tried to prevent that truth from coming out. We thought that pedophiles would besmirch the church's good name, and they do, but not as much as watching the mechanisms of power circle up to protect them against the claims of the victims. We are consistently afraid of the wrong thing. We're afraid that the church is going to look bad, and that fear leads to decisions that make the church look worse. We have a culture of sacrifice in the church, right? It's Lent. We have to be aware that our tendency to sacrifice can never apply to the truth, particularly the truth of a violent act committed against a vulnerable person. The last effect of clericalism is something that applies broadly to many men and women in dominant cultures, um, and it is Kate Mann's notion of empathy. I love that word. Is that not the greatest word you've ever heard? Empathy. <laughs> She's a genius. She's from Australia. Uh, empathy. Empathy is the excessive sympathy we show to perpetrators of sexual violence. Our reluctance to believe that people we know, right, or people just like us, people we trust, could be capable of monstrous acts. We need our monsters to look like monsters, in other words. And when they don't, when they look like people we've been taught to respect, we're far more likely to disbelieve an accusation than we are to hold one of these golden children accountable. Empathy is a great word for a very old phenomenon. Right? Look at McCarrick. Look at Vanier. Look at Maciel. Right? This line from Kate Mann is devastating in its accuracy, and I'm quoting here. The idea of rapists as monsters exonerates by caricature. Because they don't look like monsters, we refuse to believe that they are. Admitting that monsters look like everyone else gets at our original point, that terrifying, heart-stopping ubiquity, right? the everydayness of sexual violation that was revealed in the Me Too movement and in its Church Too corollaries. Right? The fact that the monsters walk among us all of the time is the really sort of scandalous and horrifying and terrifying thing that we have to face. Okay, it's easy to despair at this point. I know, I've been beating up on a lot of people. You look around at the amount of abuse and cover-up and sin and evil and just throw your hands up in desperation. Right? You look at our victim outreach, or our lack thereof, and recognize that we've decided on a ministry to survivors that Everhart correctly names a ministry of absence. Right? Absence of safeguards, absence of recognition, absence of lament, and an absence of justice. We see how our empathy confounds the victim's pain. So what can we do? I'm almost out of time, so I'm going to give you one suggestion. But it's a good one, I promise. I know, right? It always, when it comes to the constructive part, we always bail. Uh, <laughs> it's the secret of theology. Um, so here's my one suggestion, but it's a really good one. Right? This is my suggestion. Believe women. 
Imagine if we just did that. It sounds so simple. And here's the kicker. It's biblical. When I teach uh, feminism and scripture, my students are always struck by the reality that women couldn't testify in court for much of history because women's testimony didn't mean anything. It counted for nothing. It was automatically discounted. Oh, how they are shocked, oh, offended, right? But look around at the world today. Look at Christine Blasey Ford. What did her testimony do? Nothing. We routinely disbelieve women. When we talk about sexual assault, for example, in colleges, right, where women are twice as likely to be assaulted as they are to be robbed, I will always get a student that says, yeah, but a lot of times girls are lying. Right? Or the more insidious but no less disbelieving, what about due process questions? So here's the truth. Statistically, the amount of false rape reports is between 2 and 10%, which is the same rate as false larceny reports. <laughs> but we don't treat people who are reporting a larceny like that. Victims are no more likely to lie about sexual assault than they are about robbery. Some of those 2 to 10% are baseless. Baseless doesn't mean false, right? False as in they've been proven false in a court of law, but rather not proven, right? Fewer than 4 in 10 rapes are ever even reported. So there's far more violence occurring that ever makes it to the authorities. Not that the authorities are super great when you get to that point anyway. So what would happen if we believe women? Why shouldn't we believe them? Is it our desire to maintain a particular social order? Let's look at what happened the last time a woman telling the truth upset the social order, shall we? This is from Matthew 28. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he has been raised as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has been raised from the dead. And indeed, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings, and they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. New Testament scholar Claudia Setzer, my colleague at Manhattan, notes that the anomaly that all four Gospels make women the first witnesses to the resurrection, specifically Mary Magdalene. On her word, the male disciples run to see the empty tomb. Had the gospel writers wanted a stronger case, they could have omitted Mary Magdalene if they wanted and just let the men be the first to see the risen Christ. But they did not, probably because it was true. <laughs> because of the evangelist's decision to leave Mary Magdalene in the story, Christians ran a huge risk of embarrassment because the central claim of Christianity is predicated in all four gospels on the previously worthless testimony of one woman. So it would seem that Christians can be people who trust a woman's experience, what she has seen and heard and lived. Perhaps then we should recover that aspect of the tradition and become a church that believes not only women, but if we're going to use that intersectional lens, we should work to believe all those who are marginalized. That is how we will show that we have learned from Me Too. Thanks. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. We have about 25 minutes for questions and comments and anybody who would like to. Let's go. Let's have a whole big class discussion about it. <laughs> okay. I know, it's so hard to go first. Yes. So what's the second constructive oh, come on. <laughs> Since we're not going to believe women. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> well, let's do something possible. <laughs> Is there another option? Uh, 
<laughs> no, I think the second one is actual lay leadership. But like, you know, we need to really rethink how we do governance in the church and whether ordination confers the gift of governance, which I do not think that it does. Um, what is church governance going to look like moving forward? This is not working, right? Sending clerics to check up on clerics, even in Vos Estes, which is great, a great step, but I think the tendency to self-protection is too great. Right? There really needs to be oversight. And I'm not saying to set up a new cast of clerics, right? Of, because I'm an academic, but we know all about clericalism here with our PhDs, right? We're very clericalists. Um, I don't want to set up a new sort of level where then there's new people who are now above the priests and need sort of obedience. No. There has to be some sort of model of collaborative leadership that is ending up. But I don't want us to think that like, being not more non-hierarchical fixes the abuse crisis because, as I say, like, it happens in all of the churches. The question is, how do we dismantle that misogynistic thinking that says that women are objects or things to be taken advantage of? Or rather, anything that is not a white, cisgender, heterosexual man is an object that is there for the enjoyment, you know, for the sexual use and abuse of someone else. And I don't... I, I think believing women's testimony is the vital first step to that, just like listening to the stories of people who have suffered at, that, at those hands. Look what Me Too did. And did you see that happen? Like, look what Harvey Weinstein getting one consequence did. Right? One guy got one consequence, and everyone was like, I never thought it would happen. <laughs> right? How beaten down are we that 80 women come forward and we didn't think it would happen? <laughs> right? So I think that that, but yeah, I think there has to be some sort of a, a retooling or a, a reframing of our theology of the priesthood. And I think that Francis started that in Querida Amazonia, but that's not what got the headlines. I'm good. So um, hmm. is your book unique in terms of the Me Too movement and the Catholic Church? Mm -hmm. That's like A. Mm -hmm. And B, what type of feedback have you received from church hierarchy? <laughs> Fun. The book, Truth in Advertising, is not about this. <laughs> the book is um, an ecclesiology done from a Latina perspective that takes into account sort of different kinds of narratives and tries to weave narrative theology into ecclesiology. So this is new research for me. This is probably a book that's five years away. Um, but. I'm trying. I'm trying. I want to. This is so exciting and fun, isn't it? I know. Well, not fun, but sort of fun. It's exciting. It's motivating, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. Um, I think, well, this is not a message that people want to hear. They don't want to hear from me. I'll tell you that right now. Right? A laywoman with no voice. Right? Um, but I think that there are enough of us that are angry enough that something will change. Um, but I don't expect a whole lot of warm welcome uh, from the American hierarchy. That's okay, you know. Like, um, it's not for them. Since you raised the word anger, there, my question is going towards that. Like, we really struggle with how to talk about anger theologically, mm -hmm. and how to talk about women's anger in particular. Yes. Um, so I was hoping you could say a little bit about that because I think it's a significant part of this equation, right? Yes, thank you, Callie. That's a really good question. I do a lot of reading about women's anger, not just because I have a lot of women's anger, but also because it's fun to read about. There are a lot of theorists out there working on women's anger. Um, in fact, Audre Lorde, who is the, the queen of writing about anger, um, wrote about the, the motivating or the sort of the fertile ground that is women's anger and how, in fact, I think it's the black feminists who are really leading the way on this, on how to use anger as a, um, a productive and not destructive force, that we don't need to be afraid of it or avoid it, but rather that anger can be our great motivator, right? We are not set up, because we're supposed to be men's loving, attentive servants, <laughs> to express anger or to have anger heard. It's always experienced as a great violence, right? That feminist snap. It's always as a, wow, she really flew off the handle, right? One time I was in a, an academic conference that shall be, remain nameless um, with many, many, many patriarchs. 
And uh, not, it was not ortho, it's not like men who are patriarchs, but like just <laughs> patriarchal dudes. And um, we were talking about a famous woman theologian who had died. And they were like, and you know, she was just so upset that day. And she was going on and on. I don't know, maybe she was having a bad hair day is a thing that came out of one man's <laughs> mouth. And, you know, I was still pretty young in this, and I didn't get up and walk out, but I did turn to my husband and I was like, no, maybe she was just listening to a lot of comments like that and was really tired, right? So I think um, the people who are helping me think through anger right now are Lord, um, are Roxane Gay, and they're secular writers, right? Um, but also uh, Rebecca Traster wrote a great book on women's anger. She's a journalist in New York. Uh, there's a, a book I have at home <laughs> that I'm still reading called Rage Becomes Her by Soraya Chemali, which looks really good too. I think a lot of women are starting to write their anger, which is an important sort of step in making it visible. It's not an emotion that we've been allowed to have without being hysterical. Um, and yet, there's so much justifiable cause for it that it seems, you know, weird. Over here. Mm -hmm. Cheers. Okay. One editorial comment on yes. that point is mm -hmm. that that is very important uh, for women to be able to express anger mm -hmm. as a catapult. Mm -hmm. But it's also important, in my view, in my humble view, that we do not stay there. Mm -hmm. That we actually launch into redemptive action mm -hmm. from it. Uh, and I can probably say that because I think I'm, I'm a weird animal. <laughs> I am one of those gals that, whose experience as an extremely strong woman mm -hmm. has been exactly opposite to mm -hmm. what most women have lived. You know, I'm married to the dad that sat me down at age 14 to tell me everything about the bees and the birds. I am the gal that married the guy that is the most similar to Jesus and respects me <laughs> and, and honors me and respects me and cleans with me and the opposite. You know, mm -hmm. I've seen both sides, but I, on behalf of all of you guys in here that were brave enough to come to this lecture, <laughs> there's a heck of a lot of, of guys that are completely different than that. Mm -hmm. Praise be the living God, okay? Yeah, no, I think that you're... do not that do not have that perspective, and and uh, we have to empower both women. Mm -hmm. You know, the ones that have lived ex this experience and the ones that haven't, and we have to all be bold mm -hmm. to help the cause of the women of the many many women mm -hmm. that have lived this uh, this mm -hmm. experience. Yeah. So I, I think your I thought your lecture was. Fabulous, Thank you very much. extraordinary, but I, I wanted to make that yeah. point that we don't stay in the state of victimhood and we don't stay in the state of anger, but that we progress mm -hmm. as human persons, mm -hmm. you know, equal in, in dignity before the Lord, which means that my value is the same as any guy and mm -hmm. vice versa, mm -hmm. and yeah. vice versa, so that we can reach the 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 state of the church that we all hope for. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we have to be really, really uh, bold about not only talking, but about acting mm -hmm. uh, about the, in these beliefs. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. Um, yeah. And I certainly hope that it was not, no, 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 no that it didn't come across that I was like, oh, dudes suck. Please, dudes yeah, don't suck. All right, I'm married to one. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't, but, but right, there's, there's, yeah. No, but what I am getting at is that it goes beyond the individual level, right? Even the good guys benefit from misogyny, <laughs> right? I have a great husband, and I have great husband and great children. I have a guy who does more of the housework than I do by far, right? My mother thinks I'm an embarrassment to all Cuban women as a result. It's embarrassing. It's horrifying. She tells nobody. She tells nobody how little I cook. And that's fine. Um, but even, even Michael Lee, amazing, wonderful Michael Lee, benefits so much from the patriarchy, right? All of that, even I, I benefit from it, right? Because when I walk into a room, if I don't tell you that I'm Cuban, you don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you might know, because I'm a lot. <laughs> but, but my skin doesn't give me away, 
right? And so I operate with a kind of privilege that I grew up totally unaware of until I lived away from Miami for a long enough time. And so I want to move away from the individual. Yes, there are good and bad and helpful and less and people who are feminist and people who are not feminist. But what I want to get to is that underlying, like this structural miasma that we all live in that prevents all of us, right? The bold and the, and the quiet, the feminist and the non, the men and the women, the cisgender and the transgender, the gay and the straight. All of us, we're... we're held back by those structures, and we're only allowed to work in particular ways because of those structures. So yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I... Uh, oh, sorry, I keep moving, Bennett. I apologize. I'll come to you. Later. <laughs> no, I just wanted to make the point when you talked about the, the, in the Bible that they believed him, really my thought when I was like, oh, that's interesting, because I, we studied Luke, mm -hmm. and I was like, in Luke, they actually say they didn't believe her, and that Peter had to go look for himself, and yeah. I was like, wait. I had to look it up to see because... Yeah, they did. Was every night. I was like, but, okay, the, even there. but the evangelist left it in, right? They yeah, left in her testimony left in. and left in that Peter didn't believe her, and they yeah. left in that she was right. Yeah. So all of Christianity hinges on this very lame, yeah. right, testimony, this weak, weak, weak link that we still haven't quite gotten, which I find amazing. We are a tradition of people who have believed women in the past, so why not not? She was the church, right? Isn't that what Jim Martin says? Like, for the 20 minutes that she ran from the tomb to the upper room, she was the whole church? Hola, Natalia, ¿qué tal? Hola. Gusto verte nuevamente. So I have a question. I would like to know about your insights or observations and, of course, your hopes. Mm -hmm. You uh, touch a little bit about the cultural mm -hmm. aspects within the uh, reality of the or the culture mm -hmm. of abuse within mm -hmm. the church. Um, the Hispanic community is the largest Catholic minority mm -hmm. uh, in the church in the United States. Mm -hmm. So what are your insights? What, it's, what, are, what has been your experience, not only with the lady, but also with the priest or yeah. within the church, mm -hmm. um, within that reality? How much education or empowerment of both voices, the priest and the women mm -hmm. um, and the lady. Mm -hmm. So what are, I guess, you know, just bringing it back to a point, um, what are your hopes, your observations and your insights about that reality mm -hmm. with the fastest um, my growing minority within the United States? Mm -hmm. That's a great question and thank you for asking it. Um, the, the lens of intersectionality has helped me a great deal in trying to sort of, uh, when I went to college, I had like this feminist person who was Americana, and then I had this Cuban person who was not feminist, or didn't know of a way to be feminist, except in these really exceptional sort of odd circumstances. And what studying sort of these compounding oppressions what studying colonialism especially has taught me is the kind of sexual and non-sexual violence that occurs, especially in the Latino community, um, that goes unspoken because shame is this huge overlay. And because people living in exile or people living as immigrants feel they need to project a certain kind of perfection <laughs> and therefore everything becomes potentially shameful, and so all kinds of violence are hidden. That's one effect of this sort of colonial world in which we live and living in the kind of the heart of that empire here in the States. But more than that, I think that there is um, a strain of the Catholicism that was brought to the New World, right, which is different. Um, this is actually in the book. Uh, there's, the Catholicism that was brought to the New World varies, right? And sort of the Catholicism that I encounter in New York and in the Northeast is very, very different from what you get in Latin America or the Caribbean. It's very different from what you get in the Southern Cone. And so that, the original Catholicism that came to the States, this Iberian Catholicism that is very wrapped up in um, local leadership and um, sort of public practices and things like that that the Latino communities maintain, also has these competing strands of high clericalism, right, where Padrecito's always right, and Padrecito has to bless the car and the dog and the ring and the whole thing. But there's also a deep, deep strand of anti-clericalism 
that Latino Catholics don't talk about because it's a little bit shameful. But all of these countries, especially in the Caribbean, where you had slave uprisings or um, independence movements where the church allied itself with Spain, bred a great deal of skepticism about the clergy that you don't hear about. And I would like us to historically just go back and explore kind of what does it mean to have complicated feelings about the laity? Right? And how historically that is part of our history and we need to embrace that. What does it mean to have local customs take precedence? Right? If Iberian Catholicism didn't experience Trent um, because it left Europe before Trent made it over the Pyrenees. So the Catholicism of France, of Germany, right, of Northern Europe was far more sort of, it was a different philosophy altogether, much more centralized, much more parish based. The Catholicism you get in Latin America and the Caribbean is far more local, right? Far less, and I don't want to say, because I've said this before and then people get mad, I'm not saying that Latino Catholics don't go to Mass, right? What I'm saying is that the Irish people who run my son's school who think that he has to go to Mass every single weekend or else get something signed by somebody is such a foreign culture to me that it seems like Mars, right? Because in Latin America, Frequently, there was one or two priests, or you had to travel a great long distance, right? There's a great article by this sociologist, Ana Maria, Ana Maria Diaz Stevens, who lived in rural Puerto Rico and talked about how she would go to mass once a month and what it took for her to get to mass once a month, like going through a stream and down a mountain and up a mountain in your church clothes and how that was a huge hassle. And so she did it once a month and they had local leaders who ran prayer groups in their villages. Hey, we can do that again. So I think that there is great richness in the deep variety of cultural traditions that the Latino church brings to the United States that we have underexplored, um, in large part because the US is a flattening sort of effect, right? Where all Latinos are the same, <laughs> right? Where all of us are undereducated, all of us are the same phenotype, we all look the same, we all think the same things about God. Yeah, so it's, yeah, right. And so I think once we have a more um, well, whatever. I don't really care what the Americanos come to grips with or not. But I think within the Latino communities, it's our responsibility to be as, um, as profound in educating about the parts that we think might be shameful, but actually are not. Right. Yeah. That's a paradigm that doesn't work, right? To say to be respectful. Right. I was just having a very disturbing conversation with one of my older cousins about the amount of sexual violence that went on in our family without anybody. I am 43, and I learned about it three days ago. Why did, I'm raising children here. <laughs> Why didn't someone say something? Why isn't this something that we talk about in public? Why do we expose more children to that kind of danger? Right? Because we can't talk forthrightly about sex because we're wrapped up in shame, in what is appropriate, in what is going to look right, right? But who are we performing for? People who don't have our best interests at heart. So I think there is a level of education that needs to happen in terms of exploring our own resources. We have resources. We don't need to model the Latinx church on, you know, St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York. We don't need that, right? We have our own models and our own ways of resistance that have worked for generations. And we do need a deep colonial analysis, right? Because that explains a lot of the violence, especially sexual violence that goes on in our cultures, right? This, it's a, it's a sort of multi-generational traumatic legacy that we can't bring ourselves to talk about that really needs to be addressed. And that's not only in the Latino community, I think that's across the board. Mm, yes. Hi. Um, first, I want to say thank you for coming um, and for talking about stuff that nobody wants to talk about. <laughs> um, <I love> it. <laughs> my question is, um, you talked about you know, working with the clergy and believing women mm -hmm. as first steps for solutions. Do you think that this top down is more effective than maybe a more bottom up mm -hmm. kind of approach in education and like how we educate children in the Catholic Church, but also just how we talk about sex and all this to our children. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, like all the good things that have ever happened in the church, bottom up is the only way to go. <laughs> Top down has never worked, right? The church is always the last to find out, 
<laughs> the catechism is always the last to find out what everybody else has already been believing, um, which is how it ought to be, right? That's how the Holy Spirit should work. We don't expect the Holy Spirit to work in unidirectional ways, right? We're always having to be attentive. That's the hard part. Um, so I think that, like Vatican II, didn't come as a surprise to a lot of people, the outcomes of it, because so much of it had already started on the ground. Right? I think that the little change, especially when it comes to talking about sex, I am already too old. Right? I am depending on your generation to help me, which already my undergraduates do very well, to educate me in what I don't see, right? in the violence that occurs in um, relationships, like teenage relationships, that I've never seen or don't understand or am missing, right? in um, situations surrounding gender identification that are, we're contending with now for the first time publicly. That is the sort of thing that happens from the bottom up. And I learn so, in that sex class, man, oh, it is an education for me. Right? Every year they have to explain how they date, which, let me tell you something, I wish you could drink in the classroom. <laughs> it is a disaster. And I am terrified to send my teenager into that universe. But so it's this whole paradigm shift, and I just sit there and listen, and non-judgmentally, like, and then what happens? And so then what do you, and do you interact with each other in any way before the sexual contact? Or, okay, no, that's, that's fine too. Mm -hmm. And that is how I am sort of getting a hold of the landscape and using that to then be able to talk to my kids, yeah. <laughs> right? To be like, okay, please don't go on Tinder. You're 14, <laughs> right? Or please be aware of the way your friends post on social media. Please be aware of the, the presentation that you have to yourself. Please be aware of the words that you're using. When I have a 10-year-old, what a, what a trip it is to raise children right now. So I have this 10-year-old who watches YouTube all of the time, and they watch people playing video games. Whatever, I watch people buy houses on HGTV, so I, <laughs> I don't have a leg to stand on. But in these like video things, a lot of the languages, are, oh no, you're trash, right? You're trash, and I'm like, mm -mm -mm. you know, like let's be careful about dehumanizing, and I sound like a crazy prude to him, right? Like, it's just what everybody says. It doesn't mean anything. But we're trying you know, to sort of deprogram the, the dehumanizing language that we use. They already know not to use homophobic language that I was raised with, right? like a part of my day. And they already know that those are not words that we use. That's unkind. We don't do that. You know, we don't talk that way. Or you don't know what his preferences are, right? things like that. So we're getting. Um, we're getting better, but it has to be top. I mean, it has to be bottom up. Look at, they're all 90. Like, no offense, you know, but like they're not, their role is not to shake it up, right? Our role is to shake it up. Their role is to batten down the hatches, and that's how we sort of contend with the church. We've got time for two more. One, Steve over here, and then over here. Hi, good evening. Hi. Um, you mentioned the need for a, seth excuse me, a sexual ethic of uh, concern. Mm -hmm. Having been raised in the environment you described, mm -hmm. you, know, K or, you know, 1 through 12 Catholic school education, mm -hmm. I might have kind of stilted imagination in trying to envision what does that curriculum look like? I know. Who's assembling that? How is that prepared? How does that work in the context of Catholic teaching about sex, yeah. right? And not just kind of sec secular teaching mm -hmm. about sex, but within a Christian and Catholic. Is there, um, you know, is this a, a necessary change mm -hmm. in theology that's kind of needs to occur, or is this an unearthing of a pre-existing but perhaps ignored mm -hmm. theology that's already here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of questions yeah. about that issue you brought up. Good. And I hope let's, you may be able to expand together. on it a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the, the, the ethic of concern, so there's a couple of things that I think would help our sexual ethic right away. Right? The first is moving away from acts based to um, forming moral consciences, right, according to principles. 
So just like we trust people with their money, and we no longer require them to tithe to the church or get kicked out, we trust that we have these guidelines in place from Catholic social teaching and that families within the messiness of their reality can make you know, appropriate judgments with their well-formed consciences about what they do with their cash. Good. Why cannot we set out principles, criteria, and guidelines for um, appropriate sexual activity, right? Based on the inherent dignity of all human beings, for example, right? Based on the desire to um, respect and celebrate the image of God in each other, right? Based on the idea of a family as a loving relationship, right? I don't know what all of those criteria would be, right? I started studying sexual ethics when I wanted to teach this class. So, um, but I think that it has to be, it cannot be this acts based where I'm punching a card, right? Every time I've had an impure thought, I have to go to confession or else. But every time I like spend money in a way that I shouldn't, I don't go to confession, right? What is it? Every, every person who has two shirts, one belongs to you and one belongs to the one with no shirt. But none of us go to confession for all the shirts we have. Right? But if it's a sex thing, immediately. Right? I have a friend, uh, Dave Gibson, who runs the, a program at, at Fordham, says, well, that's because I know when I've had sex with somebody, but I don't know when I've been too greedy. <laughs> so it's easier. But I think that that's part of the problem. Right? That we don't, have, we don't have the ability to trust people as moral agents when it comes to sexual activity. And that's going to be hard, right? Because sexual activity is so much more than just a detached kind of, well, let's have a moral conversation, right? That's hard. But nevertheless, it's important. I also think that we can learn a little bit from consent culture on treating each other as um, two subjects, not a subject and an object in a sexual encounter, right? So this I also learned from undergraduates constantly learning from them. Um, so I had these undergraduates who did a, a Lasallian ethic of consent. We're a Lasallian school. And they went through the writings of John Baptiste de La Salle and his teachings on, on pedagogy and talked about concern for the person, um, educating students um, for life, and came to the conclusion that Manhattan College was failing to educate its students appropriately about sexual encounters. And one workshop that they came up with, because they had to do that for their research project, is um, a program where you get students in a room and you have them draw, it's so simple, it's ridiculous. You have them draw something, that, draw their favorite thing. And then they have to pair up with someone they don't know. And together, they have to draw their favorite thing or something that they both like. And then they have to explain the differences, right? What is the difference when I'm drawing for myself, I only care about what I care about, right? But once I bring another person into this, then we have to negotiate. Well, what do you like? What do you want to draw? What do I like? What do I want to draw? And in that interaction, you have the emergence of two subjects. So it's not just, can we draw this? No. Can we draw this? No. Can we draw this? That's the consent model, right? Where it reads like a contract. That's not it either. It's more, what does this look like for you? What does this relationship look like for you? What does joy look like for you? What does desire look like for you? What does pleasure look like for you in this moment, in this encounter, in this relationship? Here's what it looks like for me. Is there a way that we can meet that both of these goals are somehow fulfilled? That kind of education, I think, starts in preschool. Teaching children that their bodies are their own. Teaching children that their desires are valuable and important and should be expressed teaching children that, um, that touch and intimacy is something that they can give or withhold. Those are all lessons that we can start, they're building blocks to get to a sexual ethic that's a little bit better. Right? And I know that culturally this is very complicated. I was raised in a culture where you have to kiss everybody in an entire party before you leave. <laughs> even if it's 600 people. Even if you don't like them. Even if they yelled at you. And so, that is a violation of a, of a child's you know, free will and desire. And that needs to be reformed. And teaching children that they are, it's OK. If you don't want to hug somebody, you don't have to, is the beginning of saying your body is something over which you have control. And you don't have to let somebody else touch you. That's the beginning of a good sexual ethic, I think. But yeah, I don't have the rest of it yet. But I'm starting. Last yeah. question. Oh, good. 
No Hello, I wanted to thank you once again for your talk. Um, I wanted to kind of talk, touch briefly on the issue of clericalism, mm. especially within the Catholic Church. Yeah. Um, you call for a new theology of the priesthood, uh, rightly, in my opinion. And my question is, what can Catholics, as Catholics, learn from their Protestant siblings, mm. right? Mm. Luther obviously did a lot to elevate the laity and humanize the priesthood. Mm -hmm. um, and he was obviously a fan of food, the body, sex, etc. <laughs> Um, so I just wanted your opinion on how the Catholic Church as an institution might learn or kind of build on other traditions. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. I don't know that I have enough expertise in the other um, Christian traditions to really speak to it um, very well. Um, I can say that we can start by ordaining women. <laughs> um, that we can um, think about the notion of call, I think, is very important in some of our sister churches to think about how the community and the presider are related, right? And how there's a mutual accountability, the community to the presider and the presider to the community, that that relationship is a little bit more lasting, right? The way it is in the church now, right, the bishop pulls and takes out and moves, and when you get a new pastor, that means everyone is potentially fired. <laughs> this is not a good way of building up the people of God. So I think that there's this kind of a commitment level that happens when the, the community is involved in the selection of their ministers, that is very helpful. Um, I think that allowing ministers to minister with families is an interesting um, thing. But again, our theology is so, um, it prohibits that so seriously that we need to really take a strong look at what we mean, what we mean when we say that ordination, what we think ordination confers. Um, does it confer a power or does it confer a relationship, right? And I think marriage teaches us that some sacraments confer a relationship, right? Or confirm, I should say, a relationship. I don't understand why this other sacrament of vocation does not do that. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you very much for coming out. I really appreciate it.